Close enough. Yeah. Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> Take a majority of votes. But yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna vote to see. Uh, uh, um, we are talking about um, the Constitution in general. Uh, when we left, we were talking about Article Two in particular. What does Article Two discuss? What what branch of government? The executive. The executive. Yeah. Everything that has to do with the president and vice president. And we had just finished up with the oath. The oath of office for president is actually listed in the Constitution. All right? Now, uh, the president can be impeached for treason, bribery, high crimes, and other misdemeanors. All right? Now, one of the things that the presidents throughout history have been doing is they have been writing executive orders. Now, the first president to ever write an executive order was George Washington. Now, an executive order is for the people who work for him at the White House. You know, it's like, order more paper clips. No starch. That's an executive order. <laughs> right? Since then, Presidents have been using executive orders for a whole lot more than that. Now, let's just pick on Bill Clinton because he's an easy target. Uh, <laughs> Bill Clinton signed a total of 357 executive orders while he was president. Now, these executive orders basically give some form of absolute authority to one of the federal agencies in time of national emergency. So if there is a national emergency, FEMA is going to go in and take care of all the hospitals and stuff. In a national time of national emergency, your uh, energy commission is going to go in and they're going to take complete and total control over power generation. And other agencies are going to go in and take over complete control of uh, transportation. The FCC I mean, you guys don't do radio stations, but in every radio station, in all their radio, you know, electronic setup, they've got a chassis built into the system where the FCC can automatically, by remote control, take over the radio station. So you can be doing the, you know, the wild 50s music or whatever, and suddenly they send out a radio signal and they are broadcasting and you're not. Isn't that great that the federal government can take over what goes out over the airwaves? Now, um, I've got on page 15 of your handout, I have a list of which executive orders uh, Bill Clinton signed in which year. Notice that in 2001, and he left office January 21st, in t three weeks before he left, he still signed three executive orders. Now, Paul Begala, his uh, ad top advisor, has, has been quoted. He's been on TV saying, stroke of the pen, law of the land. Kind of cool, huh? Well, yeah, I suppose, if you're the king. It was a monarchy when the king would sign a proclamation and make it law. If Bill Clinton does that, doesn't Bill Clinton bypass Congress? What happens to our series of checks and balances? You're just thumbing their nose at it. So, I don't care who Bill Clinton was sleeping with. If Hillary doesn't care, why should I care? You know, not hurting my feelings. But, I'm a little bit irritated with the 357 executive orders that he signed. Each one of those, as far as I'm concerned, he should be locked up for treason. Now, back on page 49, I believe, of your uh, handout, is a list of web pages. And these are uh, web links that you can go to to study a lot of these particular executive orders. Don't take my word for any of this stuff. Go out and do your own research. Read the executive order for yourself. And I've got summaries down there. The, 
11490 assigns emergency preparedness functions to federal departments and agencies. Uh, 10997 Emergency preparedness functions to the Secretary of Interior. Emergency preparedness functions to the Secretary of Agriculture. But what, what type of emergency can you have in agriculture? You know? Um, and down uh, at 11, uh, 11,002, emergency preparedness functions to the Postmaster General. What's he going to do? Lick stamps for you? Why do all these things have emergency preparedness in common. They all deal with some national emergency. Guess who gets to decide whether or not there's a national emergency? President. The president. So with the stroke of a pen, suddenly you can have martial law overnight. No, no, no. This is the United States. That only happens in, you know, Angola and Russia and all those other places. Yeah, and when the army tanks come rolling down your street, you're going to be going, oh gosh, I didn't think it could happen here. The national emergency is not defined either. National emergency is not defined anywhere. It's basically up to the discretion of the president. Oh, well, I feel a whole lot better. I trust the president. <laughs> <laughs> they were talking about Executive Order 12919, which was signed June of 1994, that's not too long ago. And this executive order was written by Bill Clinton, released to the public, and just recently became law in 1998. It is an order that consolidates many previous executive orders into one sweeping executive order. Why have all these little tiny ones? We'll just bundle them all up into one sweeping order. And it says, quote, uh, and in view of the existing national emergency declared by Proclamation 2914 of December 16, 1950. Yeah, what was that national emergency? What page do you want? This is page 15. We're on page 15 of the handout. So, in 1950, we had some sort of a national emergency, and Bill Clinton is writing this order because of the existing national emergency. Did you feel like you were in some sort of national emergency in 1994? Yeah, yeah. they don't like it. Yeah, right. They don't, they just have right. to, like the point is they just have to declare the national emergency. They don't have to tell anybody about it. So, we're finished with Article 2. Let's go to Article 3 of the Constitution. Now, let me show you the Constitution. How many, how many articles does the Constitution have? Seven. Seven articles. The first three, legislative, executive, and judicial. So let's look at Article 1. It fills up all of the first page and almost all of the second page. I mean, and these are large pages. There's a lot of stuff in Article I for Congress. Then we start Article II down in the bottom and finish up Article II on this next page. So it's not quite a full page for Article II for the President. Article III, I mean, it's like less than a third of a page. There's not a whole lot there. Well, what is the Constitution? The Constitution is supposed to be the chains of the Constitution, it's supposed to put limitations on government. Which branch of government has the fewest chains? The judicial. Which one do you think is most hazardous to your liberty? Now, open up your book on the Constitution to page 31. you'll see the beginning of Article 3. It says, The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court. All right, that's good. The, uh, now down to the fourth and fifth line. The judges of both the Supreme and Inferior Courts shall hold their offices during good behavior. What does that mean? They, they just have to comb their hair and brush their teeth before they show up? 
what what does it mean that they they are elected for good behavior? It's life term. Once you're elected, you have to die or quit before you're out. You get elected once, and unless we impeach you for treason, you are there for life. That's why everybody wants to be a Supreme Court judge. You know, basically you don't have to worry about going up for election anymore. Why are we always worried about who we vote for in the popular election for president? Not that it means anything. Because you don't know who they appoint. Because the president of the United States is the guy that appoints Supreme Court judges. Imagine Al Gore being president, and who is he going to appoint as a Supreme Court judge? And then, and then you got that judge until that judge dies. That's why everybody's so worried about who the next president is, not because we give a two cents about what he is, but who he's going to appoint. We're going to be stuck with that person for life. Now, let us go to uh, the bottom of uh, page 31. This is the beginning of section 2. And it says, The judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity. What does that mean? In law and equity. And contract. Sounds like it means criminal and uh, civil. Property. Property, yeah. Okay. Uh, pretty close. Uh, you're on the right track. And then if you flip over to the next page, on page 32, um, about the... Where is it? All cases. Okay, about the fourth line to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. Okay. The, the key is in this last phrase, admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. We have a different jurisdiction. These are the three types of law that the Supreme Court has jurisdiction over. We have the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. But that is only common law. That's common law, which is the Constitution. In common law, everything is based on property. <gasps> Surprise! What do we? What derives from property? Rights. The Constitution is supposed to protect your rights, and so it's got to be. You know, common law has got to be based on property. So if you run over my mailbox, and that's my property, what has to happen? You have to restore my property. You know, instead of me beating you over the head with a baseball bat, you come over and fix my mailbox. As soon as you fix my mailbox, we're friends again. Right? There are two, um, two laws or two uh, aspects to common law. Don't mess with anybody's property and do what you say you're going to do. That is where criminal law and civil law derive from. So, I've got criminal cases and civil cases. Again, criminal is based on the violation of property. A civil case is based on a violation of your word. You promised to do something, I was going to pay you, you reneged on the contract, and so I take you to civil law. Now, just briefly, let's flip ahead to the Fifth Amendment. That's going to be on page 44. 
The Fifth Amendment is on page 44 of your Constitution. And the second to last line, it's, uh, it says, shall not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. What is due process of law? You get your day in court? Is that due process? If I've got this kangaroo court over here, I'm in West Virginia, and yeah, I've got all my brothers and sisters on the jury, you want to go and sit in my court? Is that due process? No. Due process means that you have common law, equity law, and admiralty law. Those are the three types of law that the Supreme Court is authorized to preside over. And they are different. Just like baseball, football, and basketball are different sports. They're all sports, but they are different sports. You don't stand on a baseball field and go, touchdown! People, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. Here, someplace else, that may make perfectly good sense. You have to know what playing field you're on. Now, common law is all based on property. If I haven't damaged any of your property, or you can't show me a contract that I've reneged on, you've got nothing. You can't accuse me of it, or you, I mean, you can accuse me, but you can't put me in jail for anything. Now, what if you're in your car, I'm in my car, and we intersect, unfortunately, out on somebody else's property? Where's the property damage? Did I violate your property or did you violate my property? Well, it was kind of both at the same time, wasn't it? There's no clear property distinction. I can't say this was my mailbox. There is no defining line, no defining property line. So common law really cannot apply. You can't say this was my property and not yours. That is where equity law comes in. Under equity law, the judge has, is, has arbitrary power. The judge can decide what the result of the case is. Equity means fairness. So this is all supposed to be based on fairness. Defined by who? The judge. So, I mean, if you like the judge and you trust him, that might not be so bad. But, you know, if you don't trust the judge, you may be in for a real rude awakening. Now, if it's not going to be in equity court, you, then you drop down into admiralty court. What does admiralty and maritime make you think of? Water. All right is based on property. If I go out onto the ocean in my boat, who owns the ocean? Nobody. Nobody owns the ocean. There's no property. There's no land. I can say, this is my land, and the land's not going to move. But the tide comes in, the time goes out. You know, nobody owns the ocean. And so you have a completely different <coughs> body of law. When I go out onto a sailboat, have, uh, I've said this several times. I don't know if any of you are sailors. Have, has anybody here heard the expression that the captain's word is law? Okay, It's not a euphemism. It doesn't mean, oh, the old man's just grouchy until he gets a second cup of coffee. It means the captain's word is law. It doesn't have to be right. He just has to be the captain. When he goes out into the ocean in his boat, he has a 40-foot floating country or however big his boat is. It's his country, and he is a dictator. End of story. He doesn't have to be right. He can throw you in the brig for anything he wants. You have your hair part in the wrong side. Now, if I'm floating out there on the ocean in my boat, and I find another boat, and there is nobody on the boat, who owns it? The captain. The captain. This is called, uh, what is this called? Salvage rights. Salvage rights. Thank you. It's another senior moment. 
Okay? It's salvage rights, finders, keepers. I found it, nobody else claimed it, it's mine. End of story. Is that the way we do things on land? No. This is the law of the sea. What is the Constitution? The Constitution is the supreme law of the land based on property. Common law and admiralty law are supposed to stay apart, just like land and water. Admiralty law is allowed to come up on land as far as the high water mark, originally. Because what is the ocean used for? Do you live there? Heck no. All you use it for is just transporting shipping goods back and forth. It's used for commerce. So anybody who had a ship out on the ocean, you were selling stuff or taking it somewhere to be sold. Now, when we had the United States, the United States is different. We've got the Great Lakes. England doesn't have any Great Lakes. We've got all these rivers that England doesn't have. You can send your ships up and down these rivers inland. Well, gosh, that doesn't make any sense anymore. We can't say law of the sea. So now it is really the law of commerce. It's not so much where you are doing it, it's what you are doing. So you've got three bodies of law that the uh, Supreme Court can adjudicate. Common law, equity law, and admiralty law. And those are, they're different. Right? Now, are those the only bodies of law? No. Those are the only ones that the Constitution acknowledges. So we can have that these are constitutional laws. Anything that is specified by the Constitution is constitutional. Anything which is prohibited by the Constitution is unconstitutional. What if something is not specified, but not prohibited by the Constitution? What do we call that? It's, it's extra constitutional. It's outside the constitutional, but it's not forbidden. One of your rights is the right to contract. You have an unlimited right to contract. Now, if I say, I will pay you $200 to paint the house my dog sleeps in, you go, wow, it's a great deal. I mean, how big is the biggest dog house you've ever seen? You know, about yay big, 200 bucks? Yeah, I can do that in a couple hours. Yeah, I'll do that. You sign the contract. And I walk you around the corner, and I show you this, you know, three-story mansion. You know, 27 rooms. They go, well, this is the house my dog sleeps in. Guess what? You're in deep trouble because you got to paint that house for 200 bucks. Was that a good contract? No. Is your right to contract unlimited? Yes. That's why they say read the contract. They're not kidding. Now, that's common law, admiralty, and due process. Like I said, uh, you are, have a right to common law process. The only time they can move it down is if it, the distinction of property is not clearly defined. Now, if we move to page 16, okay, Marbury versus Madison is a Supreme Court decision. It is a very important Supreme Court decision. Good and bad. Okay. The good news is that the decision of Marbury versus Madison in 1803 says, certainly all those who have framed written constitutions contemplate them as forming the fundamental and paramount law of the nation. And consequently, the theory of every such government must be that an act of the legislature repugnant to the Constitution is void. If it's unconstitutional, it was a never a law to start with. That's the good news. 
The bad news is up above that. It says the critical importance of Marbury is the assumption of several powers by the Supreme Court. The assumption of powers. They assume that we can do this. Prior to Marbury versus Madison, who decided what is and is not constitutional? Well, the question never came up. It's not listed in the Constitution. Article 3 is very short. It just says that there is a Supreme Court. It doesn't say what they can or cannot do. And so John Marshall said, well, we're the Supreme Court. We are going to decide what is or is not constitutional. Okay, everybody just kind of went along with them. They didn't have a better idea. So now, let's pretend just for a minute that the Supreme Court decides that the First Amendment does not give you a personal right to freedom of religion. It, you only have freedom of religion if you are Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish. Is that right? The Supreme Court said so. Does that make it the way things are? No! You have to remember, the Constitution says what the uh, Supreme Court is. The Supreme Court does not get to say what the Constitution is. That would be circular logic. Who decides what is or is not constitutional? We the people. Who created this thing in the first place? If we decide the Supreme Court is out to lunch, it's up to us to correct it. There's no formal way to do that, but we can amend or abolish the Constitution anytime we see fit. Well, let's rewrite Article 3. So, I've just gone over constitutional, unconstitutional, and extra-constitutional. Extra-constitutional is not specified nor prohibited by the Constitution. It is basically just in addition to. Now, there are some ideas that came about because of all this shipping. You're in England, and you ship all your stuff to North America, and all the people buy it and pay you in gold, which is the only thing they would pay you with. And your boat is coming back to the United States, or to England from the United States, with all this gold. What happens if the boat sinks? Well, yeah, salvage rights. Anybody who can get the, you know, get the gold, it's yours. It's laying right down there where the, you know, the Titanic is going to be. That gold is lost forever and ever and ever and ever, for all intents and purposes. So what they did was they set up insurance companies where you had limited liability. You have several shipping companies, and if my boat sinks. The other shipping companies are going to help me pay for it so that I don't lose everything that I had with that one boat. Now, the bad news is that if one of their boats sinks, I've got to chip in money to help pay for theirs. That's limited liability. Now, in order to have that, you have to have a contract. And only under contract can you compel performance. If, you, if the Constitution protects your rights, is there anything there that says you've got to come over and cut my grass? Can I, can, the, can I force you to cut my grass or do anything for me you know, without paying you under the Constitution? No. I cannot compel performance unless there's a contract. So basically what they've done is they've set up contract law. Now... These concepts are very, very deep, and I have nearly enough time to cover them. However, I strongly recommend that when you, you know, continue your research, you continue your research on the various types of law. And if we uh, flip back to page 16, the second paragraph there, if you want to understand the difference between common law, equity law, and the admiralty law, I strongly recommend that you go to the internet, to uh, this PTIAlaska.net 
and read the USA, the Republic is the house that no one lives in. It is a 58-page document that you can download for free. Don't give me, oh man, 58 pages? Oh, that's a lot. Okay, don't read it and let your liberties go down the toilet. Liberty is not going to be easy. Reading a 58-page document is the least of your worries. And it is at the very least that you can do to protect your liberty. And that will, that will give you a very, very clear understanding of the different forms of law and how much of this derives from Roman civil law, where you have no rights. So, we have... We want to continue law. This is not all of the law. It's the three that are constitutionally specified, but there are other laws. All the laws written by Congress since the Constitution was written are called statutes. Originally, they were organized by date. That was the law that we passed in you know, 1789. That was the law that we passed in 1791. Well, when they weren't passing very many laws, that was easy. And then eventually, it was, gosh, was that the law that we passed on Monday or the one we passed on Tuesday? And then eventually, Monday morning, Monday afternoon, gosh, was that before or after lunch? I just can't remember all these laws we're passing. So they organized them by index. And we have 50 titles. Those 50 titles are uh, part of the United States Code. And you can download the United States Code off of the Internet. Uh, and I give you a, a website on page 18. Basically at the bottom of page 18, you can download them. The only thing is that you've got to download each title by itself. So it's a little bit monotonous, but you get all the information. You can also order a CD-ROM. I think it's about $35, $40. You can get it from the National Archive, and you'll have everything on one CD-ROM. Amazing stuff. I, I highly recommend it. Now, within the United States Code, there are two types of law. Positive law and non-positive law. Positive law applies to everybody. The uh, Freedom of Information Act, Title V, that applies to everybody. Black, white, male, female, young, old, doesn't matter. It applies to you. Some of these laws are non-positive law. They don't apply to everybody. Title 27 of the United States Code is alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Now, if you distill alcohol or grow tobacco, or build guns, you fall under alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. And you have to pay special taxes. Anybody here uh, distill alcohol, grow tobacco, build guns for a living? Okay. Well, if, it, if you don't do any of those things, then Title 27 does not apply to you. And it is non-positive law. It only applies to the people who do those special things. Now, if it is positive law, it says so. You go to Title V, it says, this is positive law. Right there at the top. Well, you can go through the 50 titles, flip over to page 18, and I have given you a list of all the positive law titles. These are the laws that you apply to you and absolutely must be followed. Okay? And out of the 50 possible titles, only 22 have been enacted into positive law. Can you find Title 27? Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms? No, because it's not positive law. Please find Title 26, Internal Revenue. 23, 28. 26 should fall right in between there someplace. Title 26 is not positive law. It does not apply to everyone. And your question is, 
Who does it apply to? And it's a perfectly valid question. Okay, one that we are going to be asking the IRS here very, very soon. But basically, the people who are liable for income tax are um, non-resident aliens, foreign corporations, and United States citizens living and working in a foreign country. So if that doesn't describe who you are, then you are not liable to the Title 26 tax code, which is a shock and a surprise to many people, although not in this group. Um, now, one of the interesting things is that the current federal income tax regulations <laughs> define gross income to mean all income from whatever source derived unless excluded by law. So there are some uh, incomes which are not gross income. The regulations explain that the items of income uh, compensation for services make up classes and then regulations direct the reader to uh, another section which provide classes, a class of gross income may be excluded income. And that leads to a section, it's very, very convoluted. I mean, they can't just say it in black and white because then you'd know. They've got to go jump from here to there to there and make it really complicated. But eventually, you find out uh, that this leads to a section where the types of income that are not considered to be exempt, eliminated, or excluded are listed. And the list only includes income from certain types of international and foreign commerce. How many people here are doing international or foreign commerce? I didn't think so. So... Um, what you can do, for those of you who are interested in this, you can go to page 52 of the handout. And I have a long list of websites that you can do research in or at, um, establishing basically what the tax code is, what it says, and I'd like to repeat the three rules listed over on the side. A uh, principled American who decides to exercise his or her rights in the face of government should be careful to pay th attention to three rules. Rule number one, protect your property. Rule number two, get educated. Then rule number three is take action. Do not do them in the reverse order. <laughs> the government does not play fair. They do not play nice. If you are going to do this at all, be prepared for the ride of your life because it's going to uh, you know, take pretty much all of your energy. Now, most of the law here in the United States falls under the Uniform Commercial Code, the UCC. Now, uniform means the same, or, you know, basically everything is alike. What they did in the early 1930s is to take equity law, where the judge has an arbitrary decision, and admiralty law, and combine them together into the UCC, uniform. So the equity and admiralty are now the same. That makes everything a lot more convenient, doesn't it? Convenient for whom? Convenient for you? No, the people who are taking advantage of it. This is uniform commercial code. What does commerce mean? Trade. Trade, you know, contract. And code is not law, necessarily. It's, you know, it's convoluted. You know, it's cryptic and it's hard to understand. Now, under common law, the presumption is that you have rights unless you voluntarily waive them. All of your rights are protected except the ones you give up. Under the Uniform Commercial Code, the opposite is true. Under the Uniform Commercial Code, it is assumed that you have no rights unless you explicitly reserve them. 
say, oh, by the way, I've got all my constitutional rights. Oh, by the way, you know, I have freedom of speech. Now, how do you do that? If you are in a uniform commercial code contract, you need to go to Section 1, Clause 207, which is defined uh, I'm on page 19, <coughs> UCC 1-207, Performance or Acceptance under a Reservation of Rights. A party who with explicit reservation of rights performs or promises performance or assents to performance in a manner demanded or offered by the other party does not thereby prejudice the rights reserved. Such words as without prejudice or under protest or the like are sufficient. So you just have to say out loud or in writing that you are reserving your rights. Now why do they have to do that? They have to do that because any body of law, in order to be valid, must have two items, remedy and recourse. Remedy means that you are able to get out of trouble once you get into trouble. So if you're going to put me in jail, if I broke something, I've got to have some way I can fix it. Anybody hear of debtor's prison? Debtor's prison, you owe me money. Well, I'm going to put you in jail until you give, pay me my money back. You're in jail. <laughs> How are you going to go out and get any money? Well, that's your problem. Kind of a catch-22, isn't it? And so you just had all the prisons just filling up with all these people who couldn't pay their debt, which is now completely and totally illegal. Now, under... Uh, Okay, the other option, the other thing that law must have is recourse. You have to have some way to stay out of trouble in the first place. You know, it's like, okay, you just tell me what I'm going to do so I don't get put in jail overnight in the first place. And that's uh, recourse. And that's what UCC 1-207 is. They've got it all, all the rules are set up so they win the game. Mostly because we didn't tell you the rules. Is the UCC unconstitutional? No. Is it specified by the Constitution? No. It makes it extra constitutional. It is out there in addition to the Constitution. Do you have a right to sign contracts under the UCC? Yes, your right to contract is unlimited. You can sign any contract you want. You just have to know that you've done it. And they, they're not telling you. Now, what generally happens under the UCC is something called notice and grace. I have to, say, I have to inform you of what's going on, and I have to give you some time period for you to respond. So I send you a letter. Dear Joe, you owe me $1,000. Love, Mike. And I mail you this letter. You go, $1,000? I don't even know Mike. And you just wrinkle it up and you throw it in the garbage can. You figure this is just you know like some hoax. Well, in my letter, it says, please pay me within 30 days. Please respond in 30 days. And if you just wrinkle it up and throw it in the garbage can, I show up 31 days later with the sheriff. And the sheriff will legally take the thousand dollars from you. I gave you notice. I told you that you owed me a thousand dollars. I gave you a grace period. I gave you thirty days to respond. Well, you didn't respond, so it must have been true. So the, your response is always, always respond. If I send you a bill for a thousand dollars, sit down at the typewriter computer, mail it back going, what? I challenge that. What you can do is refuse without dishonor. You say, I don't owe you anything. Now whose job is it to prove that I gave you some sort of service? It's my job. That's what the IRS does. The IRS sends you a notice. They give you 10 days to respond. If you don't respond, you must be guilty. 
Don't be afraid of the IRS. Just write them a letter back within the first 10 days. Challenge their authority. Say, no, I don't owe you this money. Prove it. Oh, well, gosh, that's going to be a heck of a lot harder. Gosh, if you want us to prove it, you know, then we're not going to be able to collect the taxes. Good. Doesn't that more often cause, though, okay, we need to audit you to prove it. That's my Do, fear. Of what, what's your Fifth Amendment right? Go ahead, you know, audit. I've got a Fourth Amendment right to be secure in my person's house's papers and effects, and a Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate myself. You know, I, I've got my you know checkbook and stuff. I don't have to give it to you. I don't have to, have to sign my 1040 form. If I sign it under penalty of perjury, must be true. Well, if I don't sign it, you know, let me see. I don't have to give you, the government, anything that you can use to put me in jail. If I sign my 1040 form and give it to you, can you use that to put me in jail? Yes. Then I don't have to sign it. If you show me, Judge, how I can sign that without giving up my Fifth Amendment rights, then I'll sign it. But they can't do that. Uh, Bill Benson, not Bill Benson, Conklin. Bill Conklin has a website. And he's, he did that, and the judge says, I cannot rule on your case. He didn't say, you have a lousy argument. He didn't say, he just said, I can't rule on your case, because if I do, it's going to completely flip you know, the whole economic system. Oh, so my rights are going to be violated because it's going to be embarrassing for you? That's what's going to be happening in a, a couple weeks when we, you know, bring the IRS. We are doing an IRS audit. Bring in your paperwork. You show us where the law says we've got to pay this cash. Now, I think the IRS is on their way out. The IRS, by its own statistics, say that one out of five people does not pay taxes. We've stopped volunteering. It's about time. 98%? It took us a while to figure it out. Is that one in five that should, or one in five period, including kids and everybody? I think from, I, I don't know the exact statistics. I think it is one out of five people that the IRS claims should be. Okay? And if, you, if you go by my statistics, everybody who's paying taxes shouldn't be. So I think the IRS is, is out to lunch. You don't have to worry about the IRS anymore. What you do have to worry about is what they're going to replace it with. National sales tax? Oh, that's better. We got rid of the lion and we got the tiger. Well, that's stupid. You know, which Menendez brother do you want to live with? <laughs> We've got to make sure that they get rid of the IRS and that they do not institute a national sales tax because the national sales tax is only 10%. No, 11%. I'm sorry, 12%, 20, 15, you know. It just, it, pretty soon, before you know it, it's going to be 50. You know, I, as far as I'm concerned, the only flat tax that I'm in favor of is a flat tax which is zero. So how are we going to operate the United States without an income tax? I don't know. How did we do it before the IRS? July 4th, we got the Declaration of Independence. July 5th, we got the IRS. I don't think so. When did the IRS happen? 1943, they started taking out our checks. Well, they started taking it out of our checks, but the IRS came into existence in 1913. So between 1776 and 1913, there was no income tax. There was no inflation. Go figure. George Washington paid the same amount of money for a loaf of bread that Abraham Lincoln did. No inflation. So then what's Alan Greenspan talking about? You have to have 5% inflation every year. I'll get into more of that a little bit later. I want to get into that. So, so we've got we've got the United States Code, which is congressional statute, but you actually have to read it, and not all of it applies to you. The other stuff is the Uniform Commercial Code, which is private law. 
It's a copyright. Can you use somebody else's book without their permission? No. Can you use somebody else's law without their permission? No. How do you get permission? Become a lawyer. <laughs> when you become a member of the bar, then you get permission to execute their code. Now, um, I've also got a, a site here on the web internet where you can go and download the Uniform Commercial Code for $5. You can't afford not to download it. You need to have that so that you can go and reference this stuff. You start reading it, it's like they've got it in writing. And you go, I can't believe it's in print. But it is, it's law. It is a law, and you volunteer into it. How do you volunteer into the Uniform Commercial Code? Anybody spend these? Anybody recognize this? Mm -hmm. What is this? It's a note. It's a note. Every time you spend one of these, you are automatically de facto under Uniform Commercial Code. Now, what is common law? Common law is based on property or land. Now, when you are under property, you ex your uh, economy is quid pro quo. That is Latin, which means something for something. You gave me silver, which is something I gave you a book. That's quid pro quo. If, if I give you, uh, you have an apple and I want to buy your apple. And I say, well, you know, I don't have any money on my, would you take an IOU? And you go, well, okay, yeah, you look like a good guy. And you give me the apple and I give you the IOU. Have we completed the transaction? No. no. Have I given you anything? Well, nothing of any value. All I've given you is a promise to pay. So that transaction is still open. And that's what's happened when you use these notes. It, you are under, um, you are not under common law because it's not quid pro quo. You are automatically under the Uniform Commercial Code. So I have complete transferability of that note? No. No, okay. not at all. Okay. And we're, we're going to get into that in a little bit more detail. If you buy property and you say, I want your property, and they're willing to take Federal Reserve notes, isn't that? Well, that's right. why you never own it. No, but they're willing to take those. Well, you're, you're not you're not giving them anything. You are not trade. giving them anything. You so cannot you cannot law. go into a common law court because you did not give anything of substance. When you when you get your uh, manufacturer's statement of origin, I would give them silver. But when I bought or, my property, and I, I, I know what you're telling me. They said, "Great, it's yours." But you, you didn't buy your property. You didn't. Oh, you don't, you don't own it in a lodial title. You don't own it. You don't own it. Twenty-one silver dollars plus the FRA. We'll we'll talk we'll talk a little bit more about it when we get to the Federal Reserve. And that that's a whole special topic. Any questions on Article Three and the different classes of law? I do have a question on page seventeen. Your definition of positive law. Yes. Now, when I was researching that recently. I understood positive laws to be all those laws that have been reviewed in the code, that they're, they're as close and complete as the statute was, so they're considered positive law. Okay. However, not all of the code has been researched and can be said that they're complete with the statute. Okay. Okay. So those are not positive law. Okay. Not, that it didn't have anything to do with who they applied to. Okay. When, that, that when I read this definition... Well, I'd, I'd like to see. I'd like to see your definition because I'm. I'm always willing to learn. I mean, there's there's stuff that I can be telling you that's wrong. I'm not telling you. I'm not deliberately giving you any bad information. I just don't know everything. Well, like you have this definition here about a positive law of title is one which. Well, I, I've I've gotten that. Is that out your of, definition? Or I've gotten it out of Black's Black's. The, the, the top part is Black. Black's law. The bottom part is my interpretation okay. and understanding of it. So they're saying you're saying that you understand it that. The statutes have been repealed? No. A statute 
is law. Right. Code is a reflection of the statute. Well, that's why it's prima facie. Right. It's not exactly. It's not exactly. And so, whatever the code says, you've got to trace that back to the actual statute. Right. Now, the United States Code is statute. Now, all of the titles are statute law. See, it's not, it's it not code. You have to have an enabling clause and an effective date right. to be law. Okay. So, so there, but there is a difference between whatever the difference is, you know, there are differences and not all of the titles apply are like positive law. So, so your definition, I mean, I, I don't know how I would interpret that. How does that apply to? Well, like in Title Twenty Six, they have whoever, and I did read who they've empowered to go through and research this, has not gone through all of Title Twenty Six and can say that each section accurately reflects the statute that was passed. Now, what what is the statute? But see, when you look through the code, because it's not positive law, to really know what the law is, you have to go to the statute. It has no enabling I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, what now is each, the statute? But sections of the code reflect statutes, different statutes. Supposed to. Okay, yes. it's so a reflection. Right. So, so I've got United Title 26, which is United States Code. Where do I go for the statute? What well, is that? It's a comp compilation of several statutes, lots of statutes that have been passed over time, they categorize all of the tax code in Title 26. Okay. So all the different statutes over all the different years just get okay. categorized in Title 26. Well, I'll, I'll, so I'll, research that, I'll research that a little bit deeper. Yeah, Michael, I'm, I'm not sure, and I'm not trying to speak for Renee, but I read the same thing, and where I got the information, I was on one of the legal websites that ties into the government site where the uh, U.S. code is listed, mm -hmm. and this was in it contained in some general information on one. Yeah, it was on one of the general information screens that you go to before you get into you know the Title Twenty Six and Title Twenty Seven. I'll, I'll I'll go and, and, and research that a little bit more because I I've never heard that information before. You know, most people I know don't even know that the United States Code exists. So that's why, like, when they refer to code in some law case lawsuit, yeah. if it's already uh, positive law, then there's really no sense in going and looking at each individual statute. Right. have already proven it's okay. accurate. I mean, that, that sounds plausible. Uh, I'll, I'll check into that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so that was Article 3. Um, why don't we take a uh, quick break and then we'll come back and pick up with Article 4 because that's going to be a long one.